Hello and welcome to the Haiku P podcast. It's episode 13 of the fourth series, and my name's Patricia. Today, I continue our series of educational workshops, this time in the company of Richard Tice. I'm joined later by Maeve O'Sullivan, who's going to read to us from her latest work, Wasp on the Prayer Flag. I hope you enjoy it. Now this workshop by Richard Tice on place names is actually going to be in two parts, so there'll be a bonus episode in a week or so. I hope you've subscribed to the podcast. If not, perhaps this would be the time to do it. But you can keep an eye on the mailings that I send you. I'll let you know when it's published. Of course, there'll also be YouTube versions of both parts of today's podcast and the bonus episode. But there's a lot of editing and they won't be ready at the same time as the podcast. My apologies. You can, of course, go to the show notes to read all the examples that Richard uses today. If there's something that's not in the show notes that you'd like to know, just send me an email and I'll get back to you. Now, who is Richard Tice? Well, if you read the latest Poetry P Journal, the Spring 2021 edition, you'll know that he wrote an essay about place names, which I have to say went down very well. It was a topic I hadn't considered before, and it intrigued me. How can we incorporate place names meaningfully into our haiku and senryu? So I asked him to come along and talk to us about it. He's not going to work through the essay, but give us something a little bit more. A development of his theme. And today we're going to hear some examples from Japanese poetry. And in the next episode, contemporary English language haiku with place names. But before we get going with Richard's workshop, let me tell you a little bit about him. He was born and still lives on the west coast of the USA, albeit in different states. But he's not always lived there. He's lived in Japan and Korea. And as you'll see in a wee while, he was able to learn the language. I also know that Richard was something of a cyclist, as I am. Regulars will know that I love being out and about on my bike, and I found this poem of Richard's, which I love. Moving together, noise of the bike, silence of the dragonfly. Moving together, noise of the bike, silence of the dragonfly. From Shikada 4.3. And here's another one from Richard. Rising toward the slow turn of maple seeds, the child's laughter. Rising toward the slow turn of maple seeds, the child's laughter. This time from Modern Haiku 14.2. But now it's time for the first of our treats today. Without further ado, Richard, I'm going to hand over to you to do a workshop on place names. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Last month, Patricia had a workshop on Yugen. Several of the uh, poems that we'll look at today also have Yugen. Many of uh, your listeners and readers don't realize uh, how uh, brave and innovative your uh, choice of a topic is because almost from the beginning there has been a lot a lot of reluctance and sometimes great antipathy toward using place names in english haiku i can only speak about english and japanese i don't know about other languages so for a long time i've used them every now and then and i've been surprised that some of them have been published i've been told many times not to use the place name Generally, I think the idea for most haiku poets early and even now is that to make the place general is superior. So it can be any place or you know, people can immediately identify. In Japanese, the place name is common in all literature and carries into haiku. And so I've always thought that English haiku has missed 
a great opportunity to enrich our haiku liter literature. So when you invited me to write this article, uh, I thought I'd try uh, to g give a good push for it. I've had some editors tell me that they won't even consider a haiku with place name in it. Now I think it's a little more open than it was, but for the haiku that uh, I had to, uh, that I've selected today, I had to do a lot of searching for them because they're not that common. And because of the way uh, haiku in Japanese has been translated, not a lot of uh, place names have come through. So we can read hundreds of Japanese translations and find only a few examples of uh, place names because frankly, uh, place names in Japan don't translate very well. And usually if you do that, then you have to have some kind of explanation of what the place is and what it's doing in the poem. So it's very, very common in all of Japanese literature, uh, including haiku, uh, but it doesn't come through in many translations. And I think you'll find that evident when I start going through the Japanese uh, poems I've selected because most of them require some kind of uh, explanation in order to appreciate them. Now that we have the internet, I think we've uh, been able to remove the uh, main obstacle of uh, not knowing what the place name is. And if a poem is pretty good, uh, you know, I'll take the time to look at look up the place or the reference or the flower, you know, in the internet. But we're going to begin with uh, one of Patricia's favorite Basho poems. This one has uh, Yugen, by the way. Arumi ya. Sadoni Yokotao Amonogawa. The stormy sea stretching to Sado Island, the Milky Way. The stormy sea stretching to Sado Island, the Milky Way. And I think, uh, Patricia, you said that uh, you enjoyed the idea of the Milky Way extending overhead no matter where you were. I just point out that the translations in here are from our mind, except for one. I often think of Yugen as otherworldly, but it seems to be something that takes our perception out of the humday, humdrum, everyday existence into something that we can perceive as much larger or much different, or not necessarily supernatural, but it extends our boundaries. For me, it had two of the things I'd be looking for. One was the almost entering new realms, you know, stretching from Sado Island on this universe to the, to the Milky Way. But it also takes something fairly ordinary and it makes something extraordinary of it. You could be anywhere. It doesn't have to be Sado Island. You can imagine yourself anywhere watching the Milky Way just extend over your head and over from one, one place to another. Well, as you said, it could be anywhere, although it has to be, if it's an island, uh, it has to be far enough away that you can see it uh, dimly, but the Milky Way seems to stretch out to it and end there like the end of the rainbow. As for the importance of Sado, uh, that adds quite a bit, actually. Okay. <laughs> you can see Sado Island off the west coast of Honshu, a little to the north near Niigata City. The island was a place of exile, including the emperor Juntoku and the Buddhist prophet Nichiren. Nichiren is probably the most important Buddhist figure in Japan. And, and he was very much a prophet. He prophesied of the uh, famine and the earthquake, uh, and, uh, but he was also controversial. So he was exiled there to Sado Island. It's as if the uh, Milky Way uh, is stretching out to this island of exiles. People who are exiled are, are not left out of heaven. And so that's uh, fairly important, that aspect. If you know that, that adds a lot to the poem. Uh, it's not necessary to know it. Another one from Matsu Basho. This also has you again. Okoe sumite hokuto ni hibiku kinutakana. The sound clearly resonates as far as the Big Dipper, pulling block. I'm not sure if heavenly bodies are considered utamakara in Japan. 
but Japanese poetry abounds with the places of constellations and stars and the favorite, the Milky Way. The Utamakara is the Japanese word for place name in literature, but it refers to any place name, famous place name, or even not so famous place names when it's used in literature. So folding blocks are mallets uh, used in washing to pound clothes soft and dry. In the Edo period, they would usually be done at night. You'd hear these, the wooden echo throughout the area. The sound clearly resonates as far as the Big Dipper, folding block. So Patricia, do you see the U again in this? So again, you have the the sound resonating into the, the heavens, like you said, so you've got the realms. So here's one of my haiku. Matsushima no kuroumi ni uku yakouki. That was in the Yomiuri Shimbun, Yomiuri newspaper in, in 1980. But it means, in Matsushima's black sea float luminescent floats. Squid and cuttlefish boats lower nets at night and use lights to attract the cephalopods to the area. I've seen this in Korea too. You have a complete black sea and it's black night. Sometimes you can't see where the sea and the uh, sky uh, separate, but you have strings of lights out there, floats. And so when I visit Matsushima at nighttime, all the site was obliterated except for the floats. Here, since it's in the Black Sea, uh, Matsushima, you actually can't see the Pine Islands. So in Matsushima's Black Sea float, luminescent floats. So we'll move to uh, Yosobuson, Tasogare ya Hagini Itachi no Kodaiji. Twilight, in the bush clover, a weasel at Kodai Temple. So Kodaiji, which means lofty tower temple, is a Zen temple in the Higashiyama or East Mountain District of Kyoto. Established in 1606 by Nene, the widow of Hideyoshi Tokutomi, in honor of that great warlord and unifier of Japan. So Buso moved to Kyoto in 1757 at the age of 42 and took the name Yosa. So the temple had been in existence for about 150 years and had been expanded significantly by then. Bush clover blooms in late summer, so by the Japanese calendar in Busson's time, this hoku is placed in autumn. So twilight in the bush clover, a weasel at Kodai Temple. So Richard, do you think that the mention of Kodai Temple lends anything to this poem? We have to remember uh, that he could have used other temples, but uh, this is a hoku. So it's the beginning of a linked verse. And so the first verse is always uh, about, focused on something where the, uh, the linku takes place. Here is truth in the fact that uh, he's at or near or maybe even in Kodai, Kodaiji, and uh, so he, he has to use it. Here, I think uh, many other temples uh, would work. But generally, we read the hoku as uh, true to life because they had to be. So from, from Kobayashi Isa, this is from haikugai.com slash Isa. This is David Lanois. Uh, website. So if you want to know or read about Isa, this is the place to go. Ray blossoms too have one more daybreak, Mount Yoshino. So Mount Yoshino is legendary for its cherry blossoms, but he says there after those blossoms have dropped, Instead, he sees fields of yellow rape blossoms still flowering when he awakes. He may be playing with the brevity of cherry blossoms compared to the relatively longer life of other flowers. This also recalls Busson's hoku. 
Nanohana no hana ya tsuki wa higashi ni hi wa nishi ni. Rain blossoms, moon in the east, sun in the west. So when Isa awakes, the rain blossoms are still there. That's not the case with the cherry blossoms. Wake after you see them, most of them may have dropped or be wilted. And so there's a, there's a hint of uh, surprise perhaps, but also uh, excitement that they're still there. Rape blossoms too have one more daybreak, Mount Yoshino. If it was some other place, uh, then it wouldn't have that irony. Instead of cherry blossoms, you've got uh, rape blossoms. That's true, yes, because it's famous for its cherry blossoms. It's just so famous for it. That's yeah. the primary place to go. In the United States, uh, and maybe we could use uh, Washington, D.C., most famous for cherry blossoms. We have lots of cherries in Washington State in the central part where it's drier. I don't know that the uh, naming those places would work as well. But I've been lucky enough to be in Washington, D.C. when they when it was cherry blossom time. Beautiful. Of course, you don't have the rape blossoms. They're not a city city thing, whereas you can have the yes. cherry blossoms in the in the city. Well, we're going to some modern haiku. I have several from Takahama Kyoshi, a disciple of Shiki, uh, but became probably the preeminent haiku master in Japan. And many Japanese refer to him as a father of modern haiku. His influence was enormous and still is. So this is uh, taken from uh, a biography in English called Kyoshi, a, master ha a haiku master in 1997. Uh, thinking of the moon, thinking of people here at Suma. So today Suma is a ward in Kobe with a white sandy beach popular for swimming and sunbathing. It's a Meisho famous place in Japan. Uh, most notably the Taira, uh, Taira clan, the Heike met its downfall and final defeat here by the Minamoto clan. It is often felt to be the downfall of the uh, cultural and artistic uh, height of Japan. Thinking of that history, uh, this haiku has a uh, tremendous weight. Thinking of the moon, thinking of people here at Suma. But without knowing Suma, do you think that this carries uh, much interest? I think I'd have to go and find out about Suma. Yeah. But once you do know about Suma, it changed it changed the mood of the poem totally for me. And of course, we could we could transfer that to the Normandy beaches maybe then you you lose the moon because the moon doesn't have the significance maybe mm. in a western cultural setting I think it has to stay with Suma another one by Takahama Kyoshi Iyo ni umare sagami ni oite koromogai born in Iyo aging in sagami the seasonal change of clothes. So Iyo is a small city in the Ehime prefecture on the island of Shikoku, the smallest of the four main islands comprising Japan. Sagami was an important, heavily populated province south of Yokohama, incorporated into modern day Kanagawa prefecture. Each season is marked by the type of clothes we wear as the poet changes his clothes for the new season, most likely winter because of the word aging, he remarks that human life has its seasons too. Born in Iyo, aging in Sagami, the seasonal change of clothes. Here, I think it's uh, the place name could change easily because the point is that he was born in maybe a small place and then he moved to a place that uh, had more activity, uh, more commerce. That marked the change of seasons in his life. 
frankly, not. I don't know that many Japanese people know uh, where Io is. Okay. Uh, I had to look it up. Uh, Sagami, I know. I mean, in my life, it would be uh, it wouldn't work too well because I was born in Oakland, which is a fairly large city to begin yes. with. So, and then uh, I haven't been in any one place for a long time. But Takaha Shugyo, his book, uh, Selected Haiku, 2003, of a uh, selection of about 100 or so of his Japanese haiku with translations. It's a wonderful collection. And he is a, uh, a giant figure in modern Japanese haiku, still living. Umie Nararete, Amazon Mo, Ginkan Mo. Descending to the sea, both the Amazon and the Milky Way. This has you again, obviously. In Basho's haiku, we had Amanogawa, which means Milky Way. Shugyo uses a different word, Kinkan, for the Milky Way. Gin means silver. So in this poem, it's the metal and the color. That's what it means. Whereas Amanogawa, that refers to the Milky Way, means uh, literally heavenly river. Perhaps Shugyo wanted to avoid the play on Ama, heaven, and Ama in Amazon, as well as avoiding writing river, Gawa or Kawa for one, but not the other. Instead, the word emphasizes the color silver. Shugo uses Ginkan in some poems and Amanogawa in others. Both silver rivers seem to flow down to the sea. Descending to the sea, both the Amazon and the Milky Way. There are a few rivers to me that have the wonderment of the Amazon, the, the enormity of the Amazon. You probably could transfer the Amazon to another river, but we, what's, what other river would have the global impact that the Amazon has? The Amazon has that uh, feeling of primitive life, uh, the, uh, the overabundance of nature, uh, you know, rainforest aspect of it. I don't know that you could use anything else. You know, it has almost that supernatural feel. It's not a leap of faith in comparing the Amazon to the Milky Way. Arima Akito from A Hidden Pond. Anthology of Modern Haiku, 2003. In my essay uh, in the spring issue of uh, Poetry P Journal, I have an example from Arima, Arima Akito as well as one from Taka Shugyo. Ira Michibata ni Uru Hakuto mo Kudarakana. By the wayside, selling white peaches might also be Bekche. So Kudara is a, a Japanese name for the ancient Korean kingdom of Bekche. Located in Southwest Korea, Bekche was one of the three ancient Korean kingdoms along with Goguryeo and Shila. Buddhism and Confucianism prospered there and many temples and Buddhist statues were built. It was also advanced in arts and culture. Bekche established close ties with the ancient Japanese kingdom of Yamato and brought Buddhism to that country. So like Professor Arima, my wife and I visited that area, but at different times, looking for evidence of the past kingdom. We found ancient sites in a museum, but Professor Arima also noticed the vendors. Kana is a traditional cutting word to end haiku, though in its modern usage, it also has a feeling of I wonder. What remains of Bekche? Ruins, artifacts, some temples, statues, and maybe ordinary livelihoods and fruits that have existed for one and a half millennia. By the wayside, selling white peaches might also be Bekche. I had to include this because it was a place that I, I'd actually been to. There's also something I wonder, Michibata by the wayside, uh, roadside, may be a re reference to uh, Natsume Soseki's famous novel, novel, Grass by the Wayside. 
this might work for any ancient uh, civilization. I was thinking Italy, the uh, Rome, by the Forum or the Colosseum, you'd find vendors by the side of the road selling, you know, all the tackies, tourist souvenirs that we've probably all bought. Yes, uh -huh. you know? um, so mm -hmm. you, you could change that. It's possible to play with that one, or at least the ideas that that mm -hmm. one bring, brings about, I think. Well, that ended a bit abruptly, didn't it? And I'll tell you why. There's more to come. And in the next part, Richard focuses on English language haiku with place names. In August, we'll be putting this place name workshop into practice. And at the end of the next episode, there'll be a little bit about my expectations. But don't forget, you can find more information on Richard's workshop in the show notes this time. And do come along to the next episode, the bonus episode, and read those show notes too, for more inspiration. And this might be a good place to remind you that this month, until the 20th of July 2021, I'm accepting submissions using Yugen. There's a workshop with Stanford M. Forrester on the website, which will help, as of course will today's podcast with Richard. And now... A reading from Maeve O'Sullivan from her book, Wasp on the Prayer Flag. As I said earlier, I'm really excited to welcome Maeve O'Sullivan to the podcast today. Hello, Maeve. Hi. Now, may I say how lovely it is to be welcoming someone from the Emerald Isle. Many of you will know Maeve because she has had work read on the podcast before. But if you don't, let me tell you a little bit about her before I invite her to read from her recent book, Wasp on the Prayer Flag, her fifth book to be published by Alba Publishing. Maeve's been writing poetry for quite a few years, and her long and short form poetry has been published and anthologized widely over the last 25 years. And as well as writing, she participates in many poetry activities and organisations, such as the British Haiku Society and the Hibernian Poetry Workshop. I wonder, have any of you met her on your haiku travels? If you haven't, don't worry. You can find her on Twitter at Write From Within. And I know she's also on Facebook, but I'll put those details on the show notes. Now, Maeve, tell us a little bit about your book. Wasp on the Prayer Flag. Perhaps let's start with your inspiration to write it. The haiku kind of pop out and then over the course of a couple of years, you start seeing patterns emerging. Then they sort of form, sometimes form themselves into sequences. I mean, obviously the seasons are a big thing in haiku, as, as most of you will know, spring, summer, autumn, winter. So if you pick up most haiku collections, they'll have those sections in them. So I have those four seasonal sections and the book opens with those. I find travel very inspiring. So even if I go to the other end of Dublin, you know, I still find that inspiring, just getting away from your locality and getting away from Ireland. Now, obviously, the last couple of years, there hasn't been any international travel. With this particular book, there's a lot more sequences. The sequences from places are mostly from Ireland, um, which is a quite a big contrast to my last book elsewhere when I did a round the world trip and, and I had sequences from almost every, well, many, four different continents in the world. So, so it's quite a different book in that sense, in terms of the perspective. Also, because we're just out of, or no, coming out of hopefully pandemic situation, or it's, it's improving, hopefully, in the last year or so, we've had a, a number of lockdowns. In Ireland has had among, among the strictest lockdowns in Europe, the longest and strictest. Yeah. So at one point, we were limited to two kilometres, and then it was five kilometres at other times. So I I mean, I, I know my local parks anyway, but I got to know them even better during that time. And I'm very fortunate to live. I'm, I'm living within two kilometres of the River Liffey and within two kilometres of the Grand Canal. So I feel very fortunate that I, where I'm located, that I, I, I'm close to parks and, and, and areas of natural beauty and wildlife. So yes. they feature on the pages as well. And then the third section is Senryu. Then we use sequences. So I'm somebody who I'm I'm kind of a 50-50 hygiene. I'm I'm kind of 50 50% haiku, 50% senryu. 
and that's reflected in the book as well. So some of the 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 Senryu, some of them are based just at home and here in my apartment, and some of them are from traveling. Some of them um, are from people who have died, like sort of elegy type sequences. So they make up the sort of Senryu part of the book. I wanted to come on to that afterwards, but maybe maybe what I'd do now is uh, invite you to read a little section from the book. Over to you, then. Let's invoke the summer by reading a summer, summer sequence. So these are haiku, the nature haiku from the first section of the book. Summer. On the back road to the west coast, a field of yellow irises. The pier wall warm against my bare calves, June sunset. Dry month swifts flying over the diminished rapids. After four hours in the car, roadside fuchsia. Below the waterfall on a butterbur leaf, a green veined white. After the heat wave, a painted lady faded to yellow. Back to the cascades, blue emperor dragonflies mating on the wing. By the muddy path, to the old gravel quarry, wild orchids. Diving otter, damselflies, surf his ripples. Picnic basket full, rose garden on the wane. Sun's last rays dappling her wall, thunder moon. Thanks Maeve. Now, as I said, I have a few questions having listened to that and, and having read the whole book, you spoke about the sequences and you've already said this is not a new thing for you and that most of them this time come from Ireland. I wondered, do they come from the whole of Ireland or is there a percentage that are around Dublin? Because like you said, you had a very strict lockdown. I suppose the, 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 the haiku date back to early 2018. Ah. So... Yeah, so there's sort of two years of, of haiku and traveling within Ireland and some some travel abroad before the lockdowns struck. I'm kind of careful that it's not a pandemic collection as, as such. It's really only the last, you know, the last year that that's been pandemic theme has come into it. And um, I do have a sequence called Pandemic, actually, a Senryu sequence in the third part of the book. So to answer your question, I suppose, for the second, the second section are the sequences most of them are within Ireland, actually. So I have a couple from Dublin. I have one from County Carlo. I have one from County Westmead. I have one from Kerry and I have one from Galway. So and then I have one called Summer Jaunts, which encapsulates a few different places. And then I have another one called Holy Week Blessings. Basically, that was during strict lockdown. So they're all within 2K, I think, of here. The okay. Holy Week Blessings one. Yeah. So I suppose when, when I when I make a trip like that, I suppose... And I'm away from my usual kind of environment and, and I suppose the usual pressures of work and so forth. And particularly in the summertime, because I work in academia, I tend to make more trips in the summer. So I, it's probably fair to say I'm more relaxed in the summer. I tend to write more haiku in the summer in general because oh. um, my my day job is, is, is not as strenuous and I tend to travel a bit more. So the combination of those two things result in more haiku at that time of year. You said you're you're a 50-50 haiku senryu person, roughly. It's very difficult, but how do you define senryu? I suppose the, the most the simplest definition that most people know is that you know, regular haiku or, or nature haiku, nature-based haiku by and large, and then senryu or human nature inspired. I wanted to just maybe highlight a couple of poems. Couple. Sure. After four hours in the car. Roadside fuchsia brought me straight back to being a small kid. We'd arrive at the farm and I could hardly, hardly wait to get out of the car and, and brush past this beautiful, beautiful fuchsia at the entrance to my grandmother's home. After four hours in the car, roadside fuchsia. The pier wall warm against my bare calves, June sunset. Most of us have had a holiday by a lake or by, um, by the sea, and we can identify with that wonderful warm wall that you'd sit on in your swimming costume and just, you know, soak up that, those last bits of heat from the day, you know? 
I mean, I can, that's one of the other things about the haiku. It's such a fantastic aid memoir. Like, you know, like when you read that, I was right back on the wall there with, with, with my two friends. If I hadn't written the haiku, I'm not sure if, if the memory would have remained as clear. So I think that's another aspect of haiku that maybe people don't immediately think of is, is the aid, mem aid memoir aspect of it. We've spoken a lot about the poems being being Irish. It doesn't matter whether you're Irish or not. I think people could in, enjoy this this book because to me it speaks of all sorts of things that we can all identify with. It speaks of urban, urban life, your life in Dublin. It speaks of the countryside, the sea, and it speaks of other things like, like your love of travel. It speaks of death and music and nature. And of course, Richard Tice will be delighted to find that you do use place names in your, your work, such as this one, which I loved. I love this one because of the vision. It's so visual for me. A swan flies west under Capel Street Bridge, rainy rush hour. A swan <laughs> flies west under Capel Street Bridge, rainy rush hour. You don't need to know where Capel Street Bridge is because you can see, you can see the vision, can't you, with that yes. one there? And I have another one about just in that sequence as well, if I can read that one, because yes. it's along similar lines. A smell of hops along the South Keys, last bus home. A smell of hops along the South Keys, last bus home. So hops is a very distinctive smell in Dublin City, as I'm sure you know, Patricia, um, because it's it's what they use to make the Guinness. Yes. So and the Guinness, you know, the, the brewery is, is along kind of that route as well. In the 90s, I lived very close to the Guinness Brewery, very, very close to the Guinness Brewery. Oh. So I was quite close to the smell. And uh, I used to think it was the direction of the wind. But then I discovered, no, it's the stage of brewing is when you smell the hops, oh. which was quite interesting. So oh. uh, it wasn't necessarily wind to do with wind direction. But it's, it's a very typical Dublin smell. I'd like to, to end with this one and say, because it really spoke to me. Train journey taking a break from reading to watch the seabirds. Train journey, taking a break from reading to watch the seabirds. Who hasn't ridden the trains? And, you know, on a long journey, you're reading or you're listening to your, your phone, podcast music, whatever, and you take a break and you watch out the window to see the comings and goings outside. And in this one, I can really feel the sort of the, the ennui, the 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 slight boredom of being on that long train journey but then looking out the window and the wistfulness of watching the birds flying free it's just a beautiful picture for me and, uh, oh great thank you uh, i suppose a funny ps to that is that the the book i was reading was actually a, a blind spirit it was a, a <laughs> copy of blind spirit so i was reading haiku <laughs> on the train sometimes you even need a break from take, from taking haiku from reading haiku it's not, you know, it's not, it's not easy to to read a lot of haiku at one sitting. That's that's my view. Now, other people might might disagree, but it's better to space it out. I think. I wanted to end on a slightly optimistic note. Lifting of lockdown, first glimpse of Dublin Bay. Lifting of lockdown, first glimpse of Dublin Bay. Dublin Bay is outside my five k. You see, so I, I I didn't see the the, the sea for months. Oh. because I don't live it wasn't within my 5k where I, where I am in Dublin but I grew up quite close to the sea in Dunleary so I really missed seeing the sea um yes. so for me being able to see Dublin Bay again was was exciting and you, you know you, you could never have imagined that five years ago or three years ago that you would get excited about seeing the the sea that's only you know eight, maybe I don't know eight kilometers away from your home that you're mm -hmm. used to seeing you know, and the excitement of seeing that again after a number of months of not seeing it. It's kind of hard. It would have been hard to imagine that, I think, a, few, a couple of years ago. Anyway, Maeve, I so enjoyed reading the book. I would really recommend it to other people. And I thank you so much for coming along today and reading some of the book to us. So oh, tell us, how do people go about buying the book? But I think the first protocol would be info at albapublishing.com. Or if, if people are on uh, social media, they can contact me directly as well. You mentioned right from within, at right from within on um, Twitter, and then I'm on Facebook. So if, if you want to link in with me on social media, you can contact me that way as well directly. Brilliant. Wonderful. Everything will be in the show notes. So anyone wanting to get in touch with Maeve, head to the show notes, have a look, click the links, 
and she'll be there waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <Fantastic. Maeve. laughs> I really enjoyed talking to you today, Patricia. So thank you for that and for giving me an opportunity to, to talk about the new book. Oh, it was a real pleasure and a real pleasure to read it. Thanks, Maeve. Thank you. Well, that's all, folks. I hope you enjoyed the podcast as much as I did putting it together. Thanks so much for coming along and keeping myself, Richard and Maeve company today. Do go to the show notes where you'll find all the details you need from today. Of course, you'll have to buy Maeve's book to read her poems again. But you can listen to Maeve anytime you want, reading her work with that lovely lilting accent. Can't you? Don't forget to get your Yugen poems submitted before the 20th of July. And then join me next time when I'll be joined by three more lovely judges to read your haiku and senryu composed using selective realism. Until then, keep writing. If there's anything I've left out, please just email me and I'll get back to you. Ciao.